Hello, and thank you for joining us for this episode of the Health Essentials Podcast. I'm your host, Annie Zaleski, and today we're talking about breastfeeding with Dr. Heidi Suji, Medical Director of the Breastfeeding Medicine Clinic and Center. Breastfeeding, which is sometimes known as chest feeding, is a natural way babies and infants get nutrients after they're born and offers many physical and emotional benefits to not just them, but also parents. Dr. Suji is here to discuss the importance of breastfeeding, what parents can expect from the process, and tips on breastfeeding success. Dr. Suji, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to start off our conversation by having you tell us a little bit about your work here at Cleveland Clinic. What kind of research and clinical work do you do? Sure. So I am a board certified pediatrician and pediatric hospitalist. I'm also um, an international board certified lactation consultant. On the clinical side of things, I am a breastfeeding medicine specialist. I work in the outpatient center um, helping both moms and babies who are going through any challenges related to breastfeeding. And then on the administrative side of things, um, I'm involved with various research and quality improvement initiatives relating to breastfeeding. Um, I'm also passionate about uh, trainee education, and so I'm involved in the medical school as well. You are the perfect person to talk to today then because we are taking a look at breastfeeding, um, which is sometimes known as chest feeding. So what is this? Yeah. So so breastfeeding in general is the act of providing breast milk to an infant or child via the breast um, or your chest, whatever terminology um, is preferable. Um, I want to make sure that we're inclusive also of uh, parents who decide to breast milk feed as well. So it's possible also to express the breast milk from your breast, your chest, and provide it via various methods um, early on. Sometimes that can be a, a little spoon, a cup um, when there's not a lot of milk. And then later we can use things um, like a bottle to to give the milk um, to babies. And certainly when um, moms go back to work, this is often how they provide milk um, for their babies. Um, and, and breastfeeding, you know, is really uh, by definition what a mammal is. And so all mammals go through um, this process and it's what the word kind of mammal is, is derived from that mammary tissue and what, what makes us all mammals. I didn't know that. That's, that's very, that makes to so much sense when you explained it that way. Yeah. <laughs> So why is this kind of this whole process important then? You know, what makes uh, the milk that comes from the breast such uh, a good source of nutrients and just so vital, especially in the early days of a baby's life? Sure. So breast milk has a number of benefits for both the infant and mom. Um, and, and some people even refer to that early milk or the colostrum as baby's first immunization because it really primes the gut um, and the baby's immune system to fight off infections later in life. And so breastfeeding has been shown to decrease the incidence of respiratory viral illnesses, um, as well as GI illnesses, diarrhea. Um, it's been linked to a decreased risk um, of obesity and type 1 and type 2 diabetes later in life for infants, um, as well as leukemia. And then more importantly, it's linked to um, a decreased risk of SIDS and infant mortality. Um, and then for our premature babies and those that are very low birth weight or less than 1,500 grams, um, they're at decreased risk for some of the um, diseases and conditions that are specific to that population. So there's something called necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, there's retinopathy of prematurity. So some of those disease processes that we see that are specific to the really little ones in the premature babies, they're at decreased risk um, when they receive mom's breast milk. Um, and then we also see a decreased risk in autoimmune conditions um, and allergic conditions, so decreased risk of celiac disease, as well as asthma and allergies um, and eczema later on in life for baby. For mom, there's a number of benefits as well. Um, so we see a decreased risk of breast cancer, ovarian cancer. Um, recently, there was some studies published that show uh, there's a decreased risk of actually um, endometrial and thyroid cancer as well. Um, 
And then we also see a decreased prevalence of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. So a lot of the um, conditions that cause a lot of um, morbidity and mortality in the general population, um, especially the U.S. population. Um, and then when breastfeeding, <clears throat> excuse me, when breastfeeding is going well, we see a decreased risk of postpartum depression, anxiety, and other um, mood disorders as well. So it can actually be protective of uh, mental health as well as physical well-being. Um, and just a lot of moms report, um, you know, increased and improved bonding with their infant. And so there's a lot of physical and emotional benefits for mom. That's incredible that, you know, kind of both parties have just so many benefits. You know, I think people, you know, you, you think of breast milk and you think, you know, this is giving baby nutrients and this is very positive, but I just can't get over how many long lasting benefits there are for everybody. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. And the more and more research and studies we do, the list keeps growing. And I would say a lot of moms are, when I go over those uh, benefits, uh, a lot of moms are surprised at the number of benefits <clears throat> for both mom and baby. What's interesting too is, is they're showing that there's actually a cumulative risk reduction um, for moms as well. So the more you add, like if you add up all your years breastfeeding, there's an increased risk reduction of those disease processes. So the longer, the better. There's also been studies done recently too, showing that the, the longer with each individual pregnancy. So um, they looked at, you know, risk reduction, if you breastfeed your baby for two months versus four months versus six months versus uh, greater than a year, that benefit actually increases over time. Um, and so this was a big reason why uh, the AAP recently came out with recommendations to support moms who decide to breastfeed uh, for up to two years. Before that, it had been um, one year. And so now we're having more and more research show that actually the longer um, you breastfeed, the more benefits you experience. So over time then, I guess, because, uh, you know, does, does the milk change then? Are there different kinds of milk that maybe then when someone is a newborn or, you know, when a baby's, you know, maybe reaching the, the age of one or even older than that? Yeah. So, so the milk, um, when it's produced, it sort of um, provides what the baby needs at that time. And so when babies are first born, moms produce what's called um, colostrum. And this is what's really, really high in um, antibodies and immunoglobulins and helps, again, prime that immune system and, and create immunity for the baby so that if they do come in contact with any viruses or bacteria, um, they tend to less commonly contract them. Or if they do contract them, studies show that they get less sick. They have shorter hospital stays or they're less likely to end up in the hospital. Um, and then the, the milk is very much tailored to um, their nutritional needs at each, you know, kind of time point in their life. Um, you, the milk transitions over to more mature milk, um, which has a little bit different nutrient contents um, throughout the first month. Um, but, but really provides all the benefits um, and nutritional needs of baby up until six months when we um, recommend introducing solids. What's nice about breast milk is it, it provides some live immunity as well. So we know um, that if mom is exposed to a virus um, or a bacteria, mom will actually provide antibodies then to her baby that are passed through the milk and then baby is less susceptible to those things that they're exposed to um, in real time, which is is nice. Um, I mean, they've done studies even through COVID to show that these antibodies are passed through the milk um, when mom's exposed to COVID and things like that. So so is, is breast milk then completely different from other kinds of milk then? Or what similarities might they have? Yeah, so so breast milk um, and formula, you know, there are some similarities um, when you think about, you know, fat content, protein content, um, carbohydrate content. It, you know, we can do the best we can to sort of mimic um, that ratio of nutrients, but there's things that we just can't, um, you know, 
make and put in formula that are in breast milk. Um, and there's actually over a hundred of these different um, factors and proteins and immunoglobulins um, that all fight viruses and bacterial infections and are shown to be really good for the immune system in preventing autoimmunity. Um, autoimmune conditions, um, as well as allergic conditions. And, and these factors we're not able to man-make and put into formula. So all those things that you're seeing um, are beneficial to breast milk are because of the hundreds of different factors that are found in breast milk that are not in formula. So when is kind of the breastfeeding process after someone gives birth? And do babies just instinctively know how to breastfeed or do you have to teach them? How does that work? The breasts start making milk as early as 16 to 22 weeks. Um, but the, the high progesterone that's present in the body during pregnancy prevents that milk from coming out. But really the breasts are getting ready to produce milk. Um, they've shown as early as signs of conception. Um, and if babies are born early um, in the NICU, this is why even if the baby is born at you know, 22 weeks, mom, moms are still able to produce milk and pump milk for the baby, even if they're not ready to breastfeed at the breast. Um, for babies that are full term, um, and even babies in the NICU, we can kind of get them to the breast, but, but there are some, um, re like motor reflexes and, and instinctual behavior, um, that happens with, uh, more mature infants that sometimes need to be in place before the baby is strong enough um, and able to suck, swallow, you know, have a coordinated feed at the breast. Um, but a full term baby who is, you know, well, we recommend um, skin to skin right away. So as soon as that baby's born, if it's safe for mom and safe for baby, um, the recommendation is to put that baby skin to skin right on mom's chest as soon as baby's born. Um, that skin to skin time helps um, the baby regulate their blood sugar, their temperature, it helps with bonding. Um, and then naturally, it's it's very fascinating, but the, the babies do what's called kind of a breastfeeding crawl and you put them skin to skin on the center of mom's chest and you'll notice that they instinctively start to try to find that um, the breast. And so they can actually smell the milk. Um, the nipple during pregnancy gets larger and darker, and we think that that potentially helps the baby find um, the nipple better. And then they eventually will start to do things like um, sort of lick um, the breast and suckle a little bit. And then eventually the goal is to get them doing some nutritive sucking um, where they actually consume some colostrum. Um, they don't need a lot. So they've done studies that look at moms who have um, pumped their colostrum and not fed their babies the first day or two of life because babies are in the NICU. Um, and really moms only produce, you know, sometimes upwards of like an ounce in 24 hours. So it's those first um, day or two, it, the milk slowly ramps up, but it's really often like ML, like five mLs per feed that babies are taking in that first day. So they don't take a lot, but they don't need a lot. Their stomachs are actually very small. So the size of a cherry when they're born. Um, by day three, the stomach slowly increases. It's the size of a walnut. Um, but they, they don't need a ton of milk to sustain them. Um, and, and, it, and that's very... Um, I think that's something that surprises a lot of moms. Um, and so we watch their weights closely. We make sure they're you know, babies are pooping and peeing. Um, but there's not a ton of it's not like their your milk comes in day one, and it's, um, you know, this copious amount of milk that tends to happen more around day three. Um, and babies do often need a little bit of assistance. And so I say that learning to latch and breastfeed is, is sort of like learning to walk or crawl or ride a bike. Um, kids often don't um, learn those skills overnight, you know, holding a pencil and writing, fine motor skills. Um, it, it, it takes a little bit of practice and guidance. And so often um, having the mom guide the baby, having uh, nursing and lactation consultants um, help will often set that baby up for more, more success. 
And I think that that's also interesting because, I mean, uh, you know, the, the human body is such a fascinating thing anyway. And, uh, you know, but I, I think it is that parents worry. They, they worry, you know, is my baby getting enough to eat? You know, am I doing things right? You know, am I, am I breastfeeding enough? Am I pumping enough? You know, I think especially, uh, you know, new parents are very worried. They want to make sure they're doing the right thing. Yeah, we actually, we did a study here at um, Cleveland Clinic looking at what are the biggest provider and patient misconceptions surrounding breastfeeding. So we interviewed, or we, sorry, we surveyed um, a number of providers at Cleveland Clinic. Um, I think we had a hundred and about 150 respondents and we um, surveyed OB providers, pediatric providers, lactation consultants. Um, and this, and the study showed that the number one actually patient and provider misconception is that, uh, breastfeeding is easy and natural, (laughs) which we know based on studies, a lot of parents will go through difficulties and challenges with breastfeeding. Um, many you can overcome with support. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not uncommon for it to, to present challenges, especially at the beginning. Um, And then the second most common patient misconception is that they're not providing enough milk for baby. Um, And that, that um, they have a person, what we call a perceived low milk supply when actually the baby is gaining weight just fine and and getting enough milk. So I do think it's kind of a a common misconception and, um, you know, no fault at the mom. I mean, that's sort of your natural instincts is to make sure that you're providing, um, you know, for baby. But I, I think it's hard too when you're not, you're not um, seeing the amount of milk that you're giving your baby, and so you have to rely on other methods to know that baby's getting enough. Um, and so this is where that support and education is important to know, you know, how much should my, how many diapers should my baby be having, peas and poops. Um, all babies actually lose weight in the beginning, and that's normal as long as they don't go beyond ten to twelve percent. That's what we expect. And then once mom's milk comes in, babies start to gain about an ounce a day. And they they don't, most of them don't reach their birth weight until two weeks. And that's completely normal. So a lot of parents are also surprised, um, you know, to to learn that as well, that babies don't just, you know, gain weight from the get go and and kind of what's, you know, normal and um, what's abnormal. And, And again, I think it's hard because you're not visualizing that milk being given to baby if you're not expressing the milk and directly breastfeeding. And so we have to rely on um, some of these other metrics to know if, if baby is getting enough milk. And I think that's really helpful because, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think people wonder, you know, how long should you breastfeed or how long should you pump? And, you know, is, is there a standard for that, you know, and how often should you be doing this? You know, I think, does it vary from person to person for those things too? What have you found? Yeah. So every, I say every mom is different. Every baby's different. Um, and it can vary from pregnancy to pregnancy. So one breastfeeding experience um, with the same mom can be different from baby to baby because every baby is is different. Um, so you have to look at each dyad individually. Um, I do tend to say in general, though, assuming we have, you know, a full term baby who um, doesn't have other medical conditions going on. Um, we try to provide a big um, emphasis on following hunger cues um, and satiety cues. And so a lot of babies, um, when they are hungry, will show signs of rooting, sucking on their hands. They become more alert. Uh, They sort of become restless and start moving. Um, Those are those early signs of hunger. Um, When we start seeing babies crying, that's actually a late sign of hunger. And sometimes it's actually harder to latch that baby and put the baby to breast. Um, and then we try to educate parents on what are some of those signs that my, my baby is full 
Um, and so some of those signs are baby will get very relaxed. Um, the hands, I say it's all in the hands. So when babies are hungry, they tend to have a very clenched fists. And then um, when they're full, their hands will kind of splay out, um, look very relaxed. Their head will go back. Their eyes will close. Um, a lot of people refer to this as the milk coma. <laughs> um, and so looking for those subtle signs and, and starting to learn your baby will, will help you determine kind of how long to feed for. And then certainly following up with your, um, you know, pediatrician to make sure baby's gaining weight. But for the majority of babies, you can kind of go based on these hunger um, and satiety signs to know how long to feed your baby. Um, and then as far as pumping goes, um, again, every mom is a little bit different. Um, but we talk about when you're, you know, pumping, you want to first get um, that initial letdown, which happens um, through the release of oxytocin, which is a hormone in the brain that lets the milk kind of come out. Um, and then pumping until, you know, the milk stops flowing. Some moms are able to then get a second letdown. And so we recommend switching pump settings to try and get another letdown and then um, try to get that milk flowing again. So again, I, I try to focus less on like the time amount and more on um, being in tune to kind of what your body's doing and what the baby's doing. I think, and I think that's such a good rule of thumb. And I think that's so helpful because, you know, I think people might get a little bit upset, you know, like, okay, I'm supposed to be doing this for 30 minutes. I'm only doing it for 15. What's wrong? And I think, you know, keeping, you know, taking a step back and realizing what's right for you, I think can also be so reassuring. Yeah. And I think, you know, sometimes at first, I think parents need those numbers. And so we will give parents numbers sometimes if, if they feel like they need that. Um, but then at the same time, I think it's important to teach those, um, those signs as well. And so that people don't get fixated on those numbers forever. And, and the numbers change too. So babies get more efficient um, with feeding. And so as they get better at feeding those numbers, they're kind of a moving um, target. And so we'll, we'll sometimes provide numbers if they want them or a general average. But again, um, every baby and mom is different. And then as, you know, time goes on, things change as well. So. So you mentioned earlier that the recommendations are for exclusive breastfeeding or pumping for the first six months. And then, then you start introducing solid foods after that. So where do these guidelines kind of come from? Sure. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has a policy statement on the use of, um, breast milk and human milk. And this statement was, um, they, they updated about every 10 years. So the last policy statement happened in 2012. And then we recently had a policy statement published in, um, it was actually July of this year. So kind of hot off the press. Um, they revised their recommendation at that time to support moms up to two years as far as um, breastfeeding. And then the recommendation has always been exclusive uh, breastfeeding or breast milk feeding through six months. Um, but the reason for the change from um, they originally had recommended one year to two years is really because we now have more evidence that shows there's benefits to breastfeeding um, beyond one year for both mom and baby. Um, in addition, these guidelines align with what the uh, World Health Organization and UNICEF have been recommending. So two years was always their recommendation. And then third, there's been some research that shows that moms who breastfeed for more than a year were actually experiencing um, alienation and shame. Um, a lot of them weren't sharing it with their uh, healthcare providers um, and, and felt sort of unsupported and almost um, embarrassed by the fact that they were breastfeeding for longer than a year. And so the American Academy of Pediatrics wanted to come out and say, no, you know what, we're here to um, support you. There's benefits. Don't be ashamed of that. Um, 
And I think just let society in general know um, that we need to be supportive of these moms as well. So some of these moms may choose to, for example, continue pumping in the workplace. Um, and we need to make sure that we're we're supporting them, not just in that immediate postpartum period, but for the duration of their their breastfeeding journey. So, but when do you know when it's time to wean your baby from breastfeeding? How can you tell? And is the baby going to let you know? Or is the parent going to sense it? How do you kind of tell? Yeah. So, so weaning is a bit of a difficult, you know, topic. So, um, and again, I, um, every baby and every mom is different. Um, in general, they've looked at studies looking at mammals in general, and it's actually pretty rare for for an infant or a child to, to self wean before the age of like two to four is what the studies show. So most often, it, you know, it, it is the mom deciding um, if it if it's happening before that time period. Um, if it's happening, you know, if, if, it, if it is the infant, it tends to be again, like the two to four year range, and the child will just start to show some disinterest. Um, but more often than not, we know that it's um, usually moms that are, you know, deciding to to wean. Sometimes when moms go back to work, um, babies will develop a bit of a, a bottle preference. And so that makes breastfeeding a little bit harder and challenging. Um, so that can certainly play into it. Um, but again, I think the, the decision to wean is different for um, every family. Um, and sort of the the reasons behind weaning. And I, I think it's important to, um, you know, as healthcare providers to support. And if the reason for weaning is, is a challenge that they're experiencing, which we know 60% of moms are not breastfeeding for as long as they intended to. And so it's usually... Um, because of some sort of breastfeeding challenge that they're experiencing, that they wean, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, and so we want to make sure that, you know, we understand the reason for weaning. If it's something we can help them work through, um, then we want to provide them with that support. Um, and then certainly, you know, sometimes um, moms decide for various reasons, personal reasons, um, you know, that it's time and, and they're ready to wean their baby. Um, I also tell moms, you know, it doesn't need to be all or nothing. And so I think there's this misconception out there. And we know there's this misconception out here that that was one of our um, top five misconceptions reported by um, patients and providers through our research that we did that it needs to be um, all or nothing. And so um, when you decide that maybe you don't want to breastfeed, you know, as much, it doesn't mean that you need to completely stop and wean overnight. So a lot of moms will choose to, you know, especially if they go back to work and they find, you know, after a year pumping is, you know, it, it's a lot, it's hard work. Um, and it's often not the fun part of breastfeeding. Um, but if they choose to stop pumping, they still like to breastfeed their baby at night. And so you don't have to breastfeed, you know, eight times a day to breastfeed. You can breastfeed once at night before bedtime. Um, and a lot of moms like that sort of bonding experience with baby. Um, so I think it's our job as healthcare providers to make sure we're supporting through challenges and also providing um, just all the options and alternatives um, that are out there as well. That's really great to kind of stress that because I, I think you're right. I think a lot of people might think, oh, it's all or nothing. And that can be that can be very stressful. And that can be, you know, and the idea of, you know, there's there's a lot of options. There are a lot of different ways to do it. Do it with the way that works for you. I think that's also really powerful and empowering too. I like that. I like that message. I like the way you stated that to do it the way that works for you. Yeah. Everyone's, you know, every baby, every mom's different and their situation is different. Their social situation, um, you know, their support system that it, that's in place, um, their childcare situation. So that decision is going to look different for everyone. And so I think we just need to be there to support them through that decision making process. And if there's a challenge presented that can be worked through to, to help them work through that. Are there, you know, when, 
you know, someone makes a decision to stop breastfeeding then or pumping, are there things that people should not do or things that they should be careful to shy away from when they're doing this? Sure. So if, um, you know, you have, if, if you do decide that um, you want to wean and you have the luxury of time to do so, I mean, certainly sometimes, unfortunately, there's medical reasons that moms, you know, need to, to wean. Um, but if you have the luxury of time, I say it's always better to do it slowly. Um, if you wean quickly, um, you put yourself at risk for uh, mastitis. Um, there's also been studies that show that it can also affect mood. So if you wean quickly and stop cold turkey, um, there's an increased risk for anxiety, depression, um, because a lot of those hormones that are involved with making the milk um, also play into our um, mood stability as well. So I always say the slower you can do it, um, the better. Again, it's different for every mom's. Some moms can wean more quickly than others. So you want to go based on um, your comfort. Um, so you don't want to you know, when, when, if you're having a lot of engorgement, um, or discomfort when you're weaning, you want to pump or hand express, um, to make yourself feel comfortable. You don't want to fully empty your breasts because when your breasts are completely empty, um, you actually tell your body to make more milk. And so you want to be comfortable, but not fully empty your breasts through the weaning process. Um, some of it depends on supply as well. So a mom that has an oversupply, um, is going to take a lot longer, um, to wean than maybe a mom who has, you know, an undersupply, um, that that person might be able to, to wean um, more quickly as well. I think that goes right well into our next question then. And we've talked about this a little bit throughout this conversation, but what are some things that new parents might be just really surprised to encounter when with breastfeeding or pumping or anything like that, that maybe they weren't expecting or, you know, things that they might have questions about that you hear? Yeah. Um, so again, talking about the study that we did at Cleveland Clinic, so the, the top misconceptions that parents had were that it's going to be easy. So that was number one, providers um, and patients had this misconception that it's going to be easy, it's going to feel natural, my body should just know what to do, I don't need any you know, I shouldn't need any support. The baby shouldn't need any help. Um, and, and we know based on research data that that's, you know, not usually the case. Um, however, the good news is that, it, you know, when moms do get that support and that support is there, it has been shown to increase um, success and, and breastfeeding rates. Um, the second most common misconception, again, was that perceived low milk supply. So again, I would advocate if if a mom does have concern for that, to seek out the the support of a lactation consultant or their pediatrician, because um, often there's there's not a low milk supply there, um, and it's just the perception of a low low milk supply. And I would hate for that to be the reason someone you know stops breastfeeding. And that kind of leads me into the the, the third misconception was that it needs to be all or nothing. And so, unfortunately. Um, a lot of moms are unable to provide a full um, milk supply to their babies for various reasons. Um, sometimes it's health reasons, um, sometimes it's other barriers, but um, it again doesn't need to be all or nothing. Any breast milk that moms can give their babies is beneficial, um, and any breastfeeding mom is doing is beneficial to her health. And so I, I try to emphasize that, too, for um, moms that uh, are not able to, to reach a full supply, um, that you're, you're still providing benefits to baby and yourself. Um, the fourth misconception was that that milk comes in right away and baby latches right away, and there's not this... Um, slow sort of ramping up of the milk supply and that there's not this learning curve for baby. And we talked about that earlier in the podcast, but um, the, the milk takes time to come in. So first it's a yellow sticky colostrum, um, very low volumes at the beginning, and that's normal. Um, that colostrum amount 
slowly increases over the first three days. And it's usually around day three that that milk transitions from colostrum to what we call transitional milk. So it'll look a little more white, um, yellowish, and it'll be a little less thick. Um, and then by about a week, um, sometimes later, it, it transitions over into um, that full, like mature, what we consider, you know, milk to look like, and it looks more white. Um, there are moms, there are certain risk factors um, for having a delay in that milk transition from colostrum to mature milk. And a lot of these conditions are pretty common. So actually moms with their first baby, moms that have C-sections, um, moms that have gestational diabetes, postpartum hemorrhage, those moms are at increased risk of what's called delayed lactogenesis too. And so that's when the milk takes longer to come in, as we say. Um, and, and sometimes those moms and babies need a little bit more support and babies need their weight followed a little more closely. Um, and then the last misconception, um, which makes me sad, is um, it was reported that a lot of moms will feel um, like a failure if they're not able to fully breastfeed their child. And so um, again, I try to emphasize to parents that, you know, your worth as a parent or a mother is not linked to the number of drops that you make for your baby. Um, and every drop counts. Every drop is beneficial. Um, but it, it's hard. I mean, the studies show that when breastfeeding is going well, it can actually decrease the risk of postpartum depression and anxiety. Um, but when breastfeeding presents challenges, um, especially moms that are doing what we call like triple feeding, where they're having to breastfeed their baby and then pump. And then even then the baby's still needing, you know, bottle fed with some formula. Um, that can be really, really stressful. It can be tiring. It can be exhausting. So on top of all the hormones that are shifting and the sleep deprivation, all those feeding challenges, those moms actually can be at increased risk of um, postpartum depression and anxiety. And so we have to balance, um, you know, kind of all those factors and keep a pulse on mom's mental health um, through all of it and um, support them through their journey, even if that does um, look different than, you know, what they had first intended their journey to look like. There can actually be a little bit of a grieving process that moms experience if, if the journey doesn't look like how they envisioned it. And we need to make sure we're supporting moms um, through that process. I'm really glad you mentioned all that because I think that's so important to mention because and and to let people know that this is normal and you know you're not harming your baby or if, if something is not going right because you know you want to be you want to be a good parent and you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing for your baby and that can be I, I can absolutely understand um, just how fraught and just anxiety inducing it could be when it's not going right or you don't think it's going right. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure, I think, on moms, um, especially right now. I, I mean, I can feel it. It's palpable in the clinic amidst the formula shortage that we're experiencing. And so um, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of anxiety to make sure that breastfeeding is going well. Um, and interestingly, when we did our study, actually, the number six misconception was that it's um, that it's difficult. And so on the flip side of this, I think we do need to, we need to prepare parents that there may be challenges and there's support for those parents, but we don't want to create so much fear and anxiety around it that, um, again, it's affecting mental health or that people just don't do it because they fear it's going to be too hard. So it, it is a sort of, um, there's a balance there that we have to strike in our, you know, messaging and education, um, around breastfeeding. Um, it's, it's a lot of, um, I think a lot of the, the media attention around the AAP policies was, you know, that, that we are putting a lot of pressure on moms and this two year recommendation was seen by some as, um, you know, adding more and putting more on the shoulders of, of moms amidst, you know, a formula shortage and this pressure to perform and provide milk for their baby. But, um, I think it's, it's the job of society in general um, 
to make sure that we're supporting moms. And I don't think it it should all be all that pressure and responsibility shouldn't just be on the moms. And the policy does highlight um, that as well, that um, we need to make sure within our community, within our workplaces, that we're supporting um, these moms and that we're um, creating policies um, and laws to, to support moms through through their breastfeeding challenges as well. So what help might be available, you know, if someone is feeling frustrated or down or thinks they need a little bit extra help, you know, what what kind of resources are available? So at Cleveland Clinic, uh, we have a variety of different resources and it sort of depends on what you're looking for um, as a patient. So we have one-on-one Um, virtual and in-person appointments available with our breastfeeding physicians. We also have one-on-one virtual and in-person appointments available with our lactation consultants. And that's both, both on the east side and the west side. In addition to that, we have both virtual and in-person breastfeeding support groups. And so those are um, a little bit more informal, um, but still have the ability to work with a lactation consultant and get a a weight on baby. Um, But it's a nice way for moms to network with each other and um, bond with other moms kind of going through the the same thing. Um, We also have our melanin rich support group, which is a support group specifically for um, black mothers, which we know that that population has actually decreased um, rates of breastfeeding. um, And so is a particularly vulnerable population um, for breastfeeding cessation. Um, And then in addition, we have our website. So um, www.clevelandclinicchildrens.org slash breastfeeding um, includes a number of educational resources, handouts. Um, On that website too, there's a number of prenatal classes um, that parents can take Uh, related to breastfeeding education. So if they want to be prepared early on, Um, we're also happy to see patients um, in clinic if they want a prenatal visit, if they are at particularly increased risk for challenges. Um, And then our lactation consultants are also available in the nursery setting. And so they see every baby um, that is breastfeeding in the nursery every day, and they're available daytime hours and evening hours as well. Um, We actually have a pretty high initiation rate of um, breastfeeding, so happy to report it's like 85%, I think, of babies born at Cleveland Clinic um, are initiating breastfeeding. And we deliver, fun fact, we deliver over 12,000 babies a year at Cleveland Clinic. And if you do the math about every hour a baby is initiating breastfeeding at Cleveland Clinic. So um, we're seeing seeing a lot of uh, babies and, and just again, trying to make sure that we're supporting them when they leave the hospital and have that support in place and um, are able to access it as needed. That's so great that that's so comprehensive. And it's just, you know, again, you know, going back to it tries to reach parents where they are and what they need, that it's very tailored to their personal experience. Yeah. And we also have, um, there's a national hotline that um, parents can, I should mention, can access as well for after hours um, if they need breastfeeding support. Um, And then we also have our lactation um, consultants locally at the Cleveland Clinic that will provide answers via our hotline as well. Um, So if moms are unable to do a full visit or transportation is an issue. Uh, we, we have those resources as well. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. Is there anything else you want to add or any points we haven't covered that you'd like to make? Yes. I'd just like to mention that we have a new website that just launched www.clevelandclinicchildrens.org slash breastfeeding. And the website includes information on how to make an appointment with Uh, myself, um, 
any of the other providers in the breastfeeding medicine clinic, as well as the lactation consultants. If you click on the make an appointment tab, it'll uh, direct you to the phone numbers to call for appointments. The information also has helpful uh, educational resources. It also has information on our support groups, and we keep the information on this website uh, up to date as things change and our clinic and center grows and evolves, and we hopefully will be uh, providing more and more resources to patients in the future. Well, thank you so much for being here today. This has been a really great conversation, and I think it's going to help a lot of people. Thank you so much for having me. For the most up-to-date information on breastfeeding or Cleveland Clinic's Breastfeeding Medicine Center and Clinic and Lactation Services, visit clevelandclinicchildrens.org slash breastfeeding and click on the Make an Appointment tab.